Portugal's President Marcelo Rebelo de Sousa said his country should take responsibility and apologize for its role in the transatlantic slave trade, while separately, BBC journalist Laura Trevelyan publicly apologized for her family's links to the slave industry and offered reparations. So, is there a chance that a historic injustice could now be corrected? Welcome to the program, I'm Philip Hampshire. Portugal transported millions of slaves between the 15th and the 19th century. Many were sold into labor in Brazil. Current President Rebelo de Souza said his country should do more than just apologize for kidnapping so many people from West Africa to toil in its sugar plantations. Meanwhile, the British aristocratic Trevelyan family is paying reparations to the people of Grenada, where it historically owned six sugar plantations. Both examples are a start, but can enough ever be done to make up for the crimes of slavery? And should ancestors really take the blame for the crimes of their forefathers? Joining us to discuss this in London, we have Professor William Les Henry, who's a professor of criminology and sociology at the University of West London. Meanwhile, in Oxford, we have writer and filmmaker Femi Nylander. And also in London, we have author of Think Like a White Man, Nels Abbey. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining me. Les, if I can come to you first, how significant do you think the comments are by the Portuguese president, de Souza? For me, I've been saying this for years, you know, oftentimes people offer an apology, but they don't actually explain what are they actually apologizing for and more importantly what will we do as in the context of to reparate or repair the damage that they are apologizing for so i'm always a little bit guarded when i hear these kinds of things from in particular politicians because i don't know are they going up for some kind of a general election or some kind of campaigning in portugal i don't know i don't know what the broader context is for that nels how do you feel about these uh, words from the portuguese president well, for the longest time, European states have long been um, apprehensive, reticent even, to um, to apologize for the horrors of, of the enslavement of, of African people and um, the debasing of the African people that, it's, uh, that it has led to to this very day. And the, perhaps the principal reason for why they have refused to apologize is simply because of the fact that they fear that it could lead to some degree of litigation that could therefore lead to some degree of um, what they would describe as compensation, but people like myself, and I'm sure my other colleagues on the panel would describe as repair, reparation or so, for the damage done. So, in one hand, it is a humane step in the right direction on appearance, but there might be more deeper to it that I can't see because I'm not that close enough to, to Portuguese politics. But either way, um, as a man of African descent, as a black British person, uh, uh, and everything else has happened to us, so I, I, I welcome the apology. But the question, as Dr. As uh, Professor Henry just pointed out, the question is, what's next? What is the purpose of this apology, and what to what end? Where do we go from here? Is the well, point? we'll get to just apology. Walk away. We'll get to that in a second. Femi, what do you make of these comments from the Portuguese president? Is it is it your hope that this is, if you like, precedent setting? That this causes other people across Europe to come out and say similar things, or do you think this is just empty words? Well, again, I think. As um, has already been said, um, the idea of an apology often is the precedent to some kind of um, reparation. Uh, as we could, if we look at the history of Europe, you have the Treaty of Versailles, and Germany was annoyed because it had to pay a load of money, but it was also annoyed because it had to accept responsibility for the First World War. And I think that what European countries are not wanting to do a lot of the time is accept responsibility, historic responsibility for what they have done. Um, and hopefully um, more countries follow through. And I mean, he said he has the intention to issue a formal apology. It hasn't been issued yet. Hopefully the Portuguese president comes forward and issues an apology or the European countries follow through. But if that apology is, does not come hand in hand with some action, and some kind of recompense, then it's like stealing someone's wallet, saying sorry, but keeping all the cash and giving back the empty wallet doesn't really mean anything. Les, I saw you know, nodding there. Is that your feeling on this as well, that you don't just need words, you need words and some kind of action as well? Yeah, absolutely, because one of the things about, um, you know, for instance, I never call it 
slavery or the slave trade. It's African chattel enslavement. Yeah, I've said this often times that Africans are the only members of the human family who are reduced to a mathematical equation. Three fifths of a human being, whether you say it was for Southern voting rights in, in the USA. But the fact is we were reduced to commodities. We were interchangeable. And that has been deleted from the way the histories of African chattel enslavement has been taught. So people often confuse it with other forms of unfreedom or they'll say things like, oh, well, you used to enslave each other on, on the African continent. And they may confuse something like debt peonage with African chattel enslavement. I mean, some of your viewers, if they want to look, my parents come from Jamaica. They come from Clarendon in Jamaica. Some of the people there were part of the Maroons, the, you know, the Marinards, the ones who escaped. What did they escape from? Just ask your readers to look up Derby's Lunch. Think of some of the atrocious things that were done to Africans when people who look like me and us on the panel were absolutely not just dehumanized, but the way we were treated was worse than they, they treated chattel. And if that isn't factored into whatever supposed repair is, an apology will be vacuous because it will mean absolutely nothing. You have to, you know, as um, Femi has said, and Nell said it as well, you have to signpost where do you intend to go with this once you have offered this apology, whatever that looks like. Okay. We have to have some serious conversations about the history of what happened to peoples of African ancestry, because it is absolutely unique in the annals of human history. OK, Les, we've got two different issues here, though. Uh, the first issue is, do we need to have a discussion, a conversation about what happened to uh, African chattel slaves as they were taken across to the New World, which is sort of, if you like, a little bit like South Africa's Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where you unpack everything out of a box, you have a look at it and you go, well, that was a horrible, nasty mess. And then you put it back in the box again, like South Africa did, and nudge it to one side. Or you do what I suspect someone like Nels and Femi wants as well, which is reparation, some kind of monetary recompense, at which point the conversation is happening. It's just not happening in Europe and in large parts of North America. But California's just had it. They want to put $1.1 $1 .1 million as a price tag on it. Well, for me, what is really interesting is, for me, reparations is not merely financial. If you want to repair the damage, then people need to be, people need to, so for instance, peoples of African ancestry like myself need to have an idea of what Africans, what conditions they were in before chattel enslavement. Because the way we are taught histories in school is that Africans did nothing. They never contributed to anything. You know, Africans educated the Greeks and the Romans, people in Crete, Minoa, places like that. Where do we get these links in school? We don't. So part of reparations for me has to be in the context of how we are educated and edified. Because if we just focus on the financial, to me, one, it's nebulous and it's unworkable. Because how can you put a price on millions of Africans who were killed. Every time you kill a human being, how many generations do you wipe out? So to me, one of the things I, I want us, I would like us to do is get away from this lump sum thing. Like, you know, Jamaica was offered something like 7 billion. And I'm thinking, they've just spent a quarter of a billion on the king's coronation. You know, we've got to be real about what reparations is. For me, it's about re-education, it's about edifying people. So people have an idea of what my ancestors went through and why peoples of African ancestry are still at the bottom of the stockpile, regardless where we go on this planet. That's our reality. Let me, take this, let me take this across to Nels. Nels, I saw you nodding for quite a lot of that. Are you in favor of uh, conversations or do you want conversations and reparations? Or do you want a monetary lump sum? What, what would you like to see come out of any discussion on this matter? I think it's, a, it's just to be very clear, I want to make it clear that, look, the, what the, ex, the enslavement and commodification, as uh, Professor Henry so um, elegantly put, pointed out, of Africans was rooted in the, was pretty much the basis of international, ironically named free market capitalism, as we call it today. Um, it was a 
money grab. The intention of it was to actually ensure that money was made out of African people. So it was literal commodification. Um, and and I, as, a, as a result of that, I don't feel that the money that was taken from the Africans, the money that was stolen from the Africans or so, should remain in the hands of the people who, who committed the crime against us. I feel that, yeah, there should be some financial compensation. But as Professor Henry pointed out too, um, this has gone a lot deeper than just money. It's actually led to a mindset, not just within, certainly, actually, probably Africans are probably the least, lowest victims of this mindset or so, but the mindset is created in terms of actual European supremacy, or as we call it, white supremacy. Um, and therefore, to this very day, wherever you go, Africans are assumed to be the least competent, to be the least able to actually manage their own affairs, to be the least able to be able to be trusted, to be the most likely to be criminal, or so on and so forth, So, which therefore creates a slew of disadvantages for, for Africans, no matter where on earth you are, that is something that also has to be repaired too. And that's an education system um, that is going to cut across, not just for, certainly not just for Africans, but predominantly amongst European populations or so, who have been the predominant um, people who have absorbed these belief systems, but the victims of these absorbed belief systems have become the Africans. It's led to mass incarceration. It has led to higher uh, infant mortality. It has led to lower. T um, uh, it has led to wealth gaps, um, enormous wealth gaps, no matter where you are. It's no. led to every single me mechanism or metric of disadvantage that you could actually calculate. It has it has led to this. So yes, yeah, so there's the education side, and there's the there's the reorientation in terms of education side, and there's also the financial side to it, and there's other sides more to it too. It's one of the most complex systems ever put together. Well, let me bring in Femi here. Femi, um, would you like to see a conversation happen that's sort of like an open public conversation, or do you want to see monetary uh, compensation, or do you want to see a reparation, some form of a repairing and a healing of the wounds? What does the mix of that look like for you? So as the others have mentioned, um, this definitely goes beyond money, but money is still a large part of it. I mean, you look at MPs, like the person, the MP, the UK MP, Richard Drax, who is one of the wealthiest men in Britain, and he's just inherited a plantation. We know, we have the documentation, because of the fact that slavery was a business under the rules of free market capitalism, where you have businesses and they keep ledgers. Like, it's very, very easy. People go on, oh, well, we could trace back the Romans, isn't it? No, it's very, very easy for us to trace from 200 years ago, 250 years ago, 300 years ago, kind of, who made money out of this? And a lot of that money is still in the hands of a few aristocratic families in Britain and has, of course, benefit and, and Europe at large as well, fortress Europe at large, Britain, Spain, France, um, all of these countries, Portugal, um, all of these countries have benefited from the slave trade as a whole and all of them have some particular individuals within the country who are the descendants of slave traders, the descendants of um, human traffickers who are rich today because of that and they do need to return those funds however it goes beyond that it goes to it, I always say I mean like when Malcolm X talks about pulling the knife out of um, the back and then healing the wound but you can't heal the wound if the knife is still in the back and a lot of the relationships the colonial the neo-colonial relationships between Europe and Caribbean countries and also the African countries from which the slaves were initially sourced still continue today whether that's through the structural adjustment loans that are given whether that's through massive um, tax evasion and trade discounting uh, by companies on the African continent and so in order to repair the first thing we need to do is stop exploiting people of African descent and Africans and then get to the conversations about what actually happened in this history and how has it benefited Europe and kind of change our curriculums and teach Europeans their own history in the same way that Germans have to learn about the Holocaust. People in UK schools, I mean, teaching a kid in the UK school that Britain should be proud of abolishing the slave trade, in my opinion, is on a par with Holocaust denial. Would you like, you're denying Absolutely. the reality of what the UK did and giving a false narrative and denying one of the biggest crimes in human history and trying to say we should be proud of it because we eventually stopped it. It's it's ridiculous the way that this stuff is taught at the moment. Les, so all of these things need to happen. Yeah. Let, let me take this across to Les. Les, I heard you say absolutely there. Um, let, me, let me bring this back to a second um, uh, for a real life example. Femi, of course, has brought up some of the aristocratic families. He mentioned the Richard Drax incident, of course. Um, with his inheritance of uh, a plantation over in the Caribbean. Another family that's been placed in a similar position is uh, Laura Trevelyan, BBC 
news presenter and news reporter who discovered that there was slavery in the past of her aristocratic family. And of course, uh, she was able to trace her heritage back that far to that point. And she's issued a formal apology and also said she's looking to make reparations on a personal basis with that country or with those people. So is this a matter of personal conscience or is this something where you need the state to get involved? Now, if you get the state involved, and I don't know um, anyone with an aristocratic heritage, maybe, maybe they pay 10% more on income tax. For the sake of argument, if you do that, how do you work this system? Is that not going to be horrifically complicated? It will be horrifically complicated, but that is what African chaplain enslavement was. You know, people often talk about in intersectionality or interconnectedness, but for instance, you know, David Cameron, we know that his family benefited from African chattel enslavement. So to me, if David Cameron said, right, I would like to donate two million pounds to build in an institution that is going to teach this history to the local community. That's fine. But David Cameron's family only benefited because it was sanctioned by the state. It was mobilized by the state. Queen Elizabeth I more or less institutionalized African chattel enslavement. Jesus of Lubeck, you know, Hawkins, Sir Francis Drake, whatever. Because for me, if you want to get to the crux of what the concerns are, you know, you had Sir Francis Drake said, their knowledge, this is their peoples of African ancestry, their knowledge shall be our faith, Christianity. Our gain will be any wealth their countries hath. So this was a very organized relationship. It wasn't, you know, this narrative that we get that Europeans went in there to civilize the so-called savages. You only have to read Eric Williams' Capitalism and Slavery or Walter Rodney's How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. It never was a racialized relationship. It was racialized after. And one of the interesting things about, and I think it was Femi brought up about the abolitionist movement, even the way that is taught is totally wrong-headed and, and misinformed. Because if it wasn't for the women's movements here and the northern white working class powerhouse movements, there is no way abolition would have happened in the, in the way it did in the UK. Because once a lot of white working class people realized that the mortality rate for their children working in factories behind machines, getting their hair caught in machines and getting crushed during the Industrial Revolution. Once it was pointed out to a lot of them that the mortality rate was the same as the African chattel enslaved children, whether born in the Caribbean or, or exported from the continent, or I should say imported from the continent, these people realized that the enemy was the state, it was the government, and it was the system. Because the child mortality rate during the heyday of, let's say, African chattel enslavement or the Industrial Revolution, if you put a child in a factory to clean, I don't know, chimneys or chuck them down mines at four, they were dead by nine, ten. That is the same mortality rate as what happens in the Caribbean. And that, for me, is why when we, when we say to teach a more complete history to repair that damage, if you put the information out there, people can make more informed choices. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, it's like when people say, um, destroy all white canons of knowledge. No, Les doesn't say that. I say leave them there, but find some other white scholars. Forget about African scholars or, or other scholars. Find some white scholars who are absolutely 100% against the state-sanctioned um, atrocities, the African Holocaust. Why don't we find balance in that way? Because for me, these are the kind of conversations we need to have. We need to be more historically informed. Because once people see parallels and they see a commonality of their condition, then they'll realize, well, if it wasn't for black people at the bottom of the, the human ladder, now the bottom rung, if it wasn't for black people in the UK, who would be there? The Irish would comfortably be there. White working class people would comfortably be there. This is what I'm talking about, repairing those historical breaches. Right, let me take it across to Nels. Nels, uh, you agree with that, I'm assuming. Let me play for you a clip that didn't come from, we've already talked about the Portuguese uh, prime minister coming out, the Portuguese president, rather, coming out and making comments. 
Let's have Mark Rutte, who is the Dutch Prime Minister. Here's what he had to say. For centuries, under the Dutch state authority, human dignity has been trampled on in the most horrible way. And too few Dutch governments after 1863 have seen and acknowledged that our slavery past had, and still has, a negative impact. For this, I apologise on behalf of the Dutch government. Nels, um, so that's an apology out of, uh, out of Holland. So you've got an apology out of uh, Portugal, an apology out of Holland. Possibly you may be able to get... Uh, uh, you may be able to get those made, if you like, uh, state-supported apologies as opposed to simply somebody saying words into a microphone so they become official. What does this get you? Does it get black people anything? Uh, does it help lift them? Does it help them have hope for the future? Or again, is it just empty words unless there's something attached to it? Well, it's, it's empty words unless there's something attached to it, but it's empty words that, that formed pretty much a wall uh, that was formed as a wall against any form of um, progress on this pro of this of this process for pretty for hundreds of years. So the idea of European states apologising um, um, for the trust for the crimes, the prof the highly profitable crimes of the enslavement and commodification of the Africans, um, is something is is as new as it could be. In fact, if you come to the United Kingdom, um, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was um, invited to apologise by a member of Parliament over here. And um, he bluntly refused, and I think that Britain will probably be the last, might be the last brick in the wall standing. But the key thing about it is that look, is it um, is it is it empty words or so without reparations, without for some form of re without a real root and branch review of what has actually happened here and how we get things back to where they should be properly, how we assist in the rehumanification and the redignification of the Africans, no matter where they may be, is it has to be a major project for all of humanity, it has to be a major project for European states. If when you take a look at it, so there's the slavery side of things too. If you, if you take a look at what happened, there was the, what happened with the, the atrocity of the enslavement, and then there was the wholesale um, commodification of Africans and Africa, as a, as a unit, as in with colonization, which went, uh, which went again, which just took it to a whole nother level or so. Uh, and it's, we're just coming right now in these days through the liberation stages of, we went through the first liberation stage with the abolishment of, um, of the enslavement, which started with the Haitians, of course, in the, um, it, with the Haitian revolution. Well, that was the first really successful blow for it, against it. Then we get to the, uh, the, the abolition of, um, of, um, of colonization, which started in the in the 57, 1957 with Ghana. Um, I think the most recent one probably is Zimbabwe in 1980, certainly in the United Kingdom. And there are, of course, um, uh, so this continues to go on. And but we're at that stage right now where we're now looking at, we're looking at the, they're probably looking at the apology side of the actual liberation movement. Fair enough. We're looking at the repair and um, re repair Recompense and reorientate and re-educate side of it. Well, and that's where we we're, understand. We're running out, out of we're running out of time here. I'm sorry to cut you off there, Nels, but I want to bring Femi in uh, just quickly because we only got a couple of minutes left. Um, Femi, uh, what would you like to see happen from here? Uh, do you want to see sort of the European Union, because they're a big intergovernmental body, start taking a look at this? Do you want to see private individuals deal with it, as we saw with the Trevelyan family and as the Drax family are entering into individual negotiations with governments? We've got two ends of the spectrum. We can take this out, a community effort or an individual effort. What do you want to see? So private individuals, I mean, coercing private individuals is never going to be enough at the end of the day because then it's still in their hands and if 50% decide to do it then the remaining 50% have <laughs> decided not to there needs to be something from either a national or a transnational as you say kind of like a supranational um, organization such as the EU the problem is the EU at the moment is trying to <laughs> drown migrants <laughs> basically and has, is, is in no way in a fit place to um, or is in no way as, a, as as an institution kind of in the um, ideological place where they're going to actually start dealing with the issues that Europe has at, in terms of its history. It's more in terms of fortress Europe. How do we keep them all out now that they're poor and we're rich? Um, but definitely um, there needs to be um, something institutional. 
whether that's from an institution like the UN, whether that's some, like, from an institution like the EU, whether that's from nation states themselves, it needs to be a top-down process where we, yeah, we can't rely on Richard Drax to beneficently give back this money because otherwise it's going to take generations and it's never going to happen. Well, I understand today. all of your okay. positions there, but I'm afraid we've run out of time. It's been a pleasure having you on. Les, Femi, Nels, you've been uh, absolutely superb today. It's been a pleasure. If you want to find more discussion and debate, just head on over to our YouTube channel and search for Roundtable TRT World. But for now, from me here and all of the team, thank you for watching and goodbye.